A great and mighty army stares outward, perched high upon its citadel walls, and watches immobilized as the enemy hordes close in. The citadel is strong, built by the fathers and forefathers of those who defend it now, and the legions inside have no intention of giving it up. But the enemies outside are an insidious bunch, and they will attack, and they will bombard, they will undermine, they will encircle, and they will wait. Most of all, they will wait. They will wait, and they will wait. Perhaps until the defenders just can't stand their hunger anymore, or their thirst. They are besieged now, with nothing to do but endure, keep watch, and hope that when the enemy chooses its moment to strike, the defenders will still be alive to resist. In today's instalment of our ongoing series, The Art of War, we're going to be digging into the tactics and strategy of siege warfare. Why it happens, how it works, how it's evolved through time, and some of the most famous among the innumerable sieges that have defined human history. Now, all siege warfare, no matter how ancient or how modern, relies on the central role of a fortress, a static, strong, defensible position from which a defending force believes that it can successfully hold out. Now, we use fortress as something of a broad term here, depending on the conflict. A fortress can be a mighty castle or a great citadel constructed over the course of decades with the sole objective of making an assault on its grounds impossible. It could also be a more minor fort or an entrenchment or a bunker or even a city. But the basic premise is always the same. It's a place where a defending force can retreat to, giving up a surrounding area or even allowing itself to be encircled while resting comfortably in the knowledge that an attack on the fortress itself would be far too painful painful for an attacking force to bear. But choosing to retreat to a defensive posture at a fortress also comes with its risks. By giving up access to the surrounding area, a defending army also gives up its ability to resupply, meaning that the attacking force is incentivized to play a waiting game. Knowing that the enemy is likely to run out of critical supplies like food, water, and medicine before the attackers do, and knowing that the attackers can rely on the surrounding country for replenishment while the defenders can't means they're at liberty to conserve their troops and their energy and simply wait for the defenders to fold. In ancient times, defenders who could retreat to a port city and keep resupply coming by sea could get around this problem, and so can modern militaries that have the capability to drop supplies by air. But if a defending army had neither of those advantages, it would be their job to hold out on whatever supplies they'd been able to store away. Even once a siege becomes a waiting game, it's rarely going to be a static affair. Depending on the demands and broader situation in a given war, attackers might be on a time crunch themselves, trying to destroy defenders and take a fortress before reinforcements can arrive to break the siege in the defenders' favor. Or they might not want to wait around forever, or have other reasons to hasten a surrender or an attack. In this case, an attacking force is likely to invest itself into other forms of assault while not attempting a battle outright. In historical sieges, this might have looked like the use of heavy siege weapons like catapults or trebuchets to wear away at a citadel's walls until they eventually crumbled. It might look like flinging disease-ridden corpses of humans or animals inside the city walls in hopes of spreading disease among the defenders or poisoning water sources like rivers that might flow through a city. It might look like attempts to tunnel underneath the city and build a point of infiltration or to entice the defenders to attempt to break out that the attacking force can use to kill off their adversaries. In modern times, many of those tactics still work just fine, as well as artillery shelling, air bombardment, and information warfare in the digital space. Then there's the matter of physical defenses, where we're going to discuss pre-industrial sieges separately from post-industrial ones. Now, across ancient history, cultures that had the ability to invest in fortified cities, castles, and great military citadels would usually do so, relying on them as a critical anchor of any defense that might come about. In most cases, across cultures, these citadels would rely on massive outer walls, often using other natural barriers like trenches, water-filled moats or lakes, or manually constructed traps to prevent enemy forces from coming inside. These walls could typically withstand heavy missiles and battering rams, and sometimes they were even built in multiple layers of defense so that an attacking force that penetrated an outer castle would still have to get through the walls of an inner castle. High turrets would give defenders a clear view of an attacking force, and likely points of entry would be fortified with heavy reinforced doors as well as overhanging holes from which rocks, hot oil, or other nasty things could be dumped onto the heads of attackers. Narrow slits built into walls would allow archers to fire outward from cover, and even inside the inner walls of a fortress, spiral staircases would be built to allow right-handed defenders open spaces to wave their weapons, while attackers would have to grip their weapons in their left hands, which is usually the weaker one. 
The area surrounding her citadel would often be built with dry moats, outer trenches, stone walls, and other features meant to inconvenience them. And since siege warfare tends to follow basically the same rules no matter where a war takes place, these characteristics of a citadel can be commonly found in historical Europe, Asia, Africa, and in the New World. Now, things changed a bit in the Industrial Age when explosive weapons like cannons, which had already been a major problem for otherwise impenetrable castle defenses, were replaced by artillery. Facing this new set of problems, grand castles and citadels gave way to strongholds that were built less to be visually striking or imposing, and more to be able to weather long assaults while keeping defenders alive. Now forts and bunkers would often be built partially or completely into the ground, taking advantage of meters of rock and soil to insulate the people from harm. Large-scale constructions have had to emphasize survivability rather than aesthetic beauty, and after the First World War, they've largely been abandoned. That's not to say that sieges still don't happen, they absolutely do, but these days, the fortifications a defending army will rely upon are typically either natural barriers like mountains or the features of a city. So too is the manner of attack significantly different in modern siege warfare compared to ancient examples. In years long gone, sieges of castles or fortresses would have to be broken with the use of so-called siege engines, devices that were meant to overcome the built defensive fortifications of the place where the defenders were hiding. Battering rams were built to smash through gates or walls, while siege towers could protect a group of soldiers as they approached the top of a castle wall and then deposit them on the wall and then provide ladders or ramps to yet more soldiers you could then stream upward. Catapults, trebuchets, mangonels, onagers, and sometimes cannons would be used to bring down walls and create a pathway in, while those tunnels that we mentioned before could offer troops a direct path into unfortified areas of a walled city or castle, or give them means to detonate explosives directly under the walls themselves. Once the attack progressed past the city walls, troops often found themselves in a much better position to take on the defenders who might be starving, sick, worn down, or badly outnumbered. After the age of gunpowder began and heavy weaponry made its way across the world, attacking a heavily walled fortification was a simple matter of blowing some holes into the walls and rushing through them. When fortresses changed their shape into star-shaped or other oblique designs called trace Italien that uh, would keep artillery from getting a direct hit, attackers were set back. But they also benefited from the far greater costs that a defender would have to cough up in order to build such things. After the Industrial Age, machine guns, heavy artillery, and other advanced weapons largely did away with the utility of large fortifications, meaning that now an attacker moving on a besieged target was likely to be able to rely on mobile forces, tanks, airplanes, and the like, to be able to overrun besieged positions. Now, one thing that hasn't changed over time is the potential for a siege to force a surrender rather than a final battle. And while siege warfare historically provides an advantage to the defender in direct combat, it provides a massive advantage to the attacker in situations where a surrender does occur. With the attacker usually much better supplied, a truly successful siege can see an attacking force come out completely unscathed and see its soldiers return home fat, happy, and significantly richer after their plunder of whatever they were besieging. Defenders, by contrast, may have incurred serious losses without even being attacked, as not only soldiers but civilians inside the siege walls are forced to waste away and die, still waiting for relief. And lastly, we've got to talk about the use of siege warfare not just from a tactical perspective, but from a broader strategic one. Historically, winning a siege has often meant winning a war, sometimes because a ruler would be holed up inside a national seat of power along with their best troops, or at other times because a high proportion of a nation's army was involved in a siege at one concentrated spot, so much so that a war would be all but unwinnable without them. Even when that's not the case, a siege is generally an immensely important pivot point in a conflict to the point where other military efforts will largely be about supplying both sides of a siege, causing a breakthrough, counterattacking a besieging force, running a blockade, or resolving battles elsewhere in order to change the balance of a siege. With the immense investment of resources that a siege demands both for an attacker and for a defending force, these sorts of battles usually don't take place unless both sides believe the battle is worth the risk. Otherwise, the attacking force would simply go elsewhere or the defenders would abandon their fortifications and fight another day. If a siege is happening at all, it's because the target involved is so significant to both sides that it's worth risking catastrophic defeat for a chance a total victory. So siege warfare has been a part of the historical record for nearly as long as there has been a historical record with Assyria, Sumeria, Babylon, the Indus Valley Civilization, and a range of other pre-2000 BCE civilizations building the sorts of fortifications that would have allowed them to withstand major attack. 
The Shang Dynasty was capable of building immense fortifications some 1,500 years before Julius Caesar even walked the earth, and the Mycenaean Greeks constructed the great Cyclopean walls no later than 1,000 BC in the Late Bronze Age. Israel and Cyprus have yielded archaeological evidence of ancient siege fortifications, and pre-dynastic Egyptian artists include siege equipment in some of the tomb reliefs of that age. In fact, it's in the 15th century BCE that the first major siege was recorded as it happened during the Battle of Megiddo in what was then known as Canaan in modern-day Israel. As the surviving Egyptian sources tell it, an Egyptian force had routed a Canaanite force using a chariot charge, forcing those Canaanites to retreat into the city of Megiddo. The resulting siege lasted for seven months before the Egyptians were able to wait out the Canaanites and force a surrender. To hear sources of the time tell it, the city always spared pillage and the battle was a major turning point in Egypt's expansion of its influence. Among the most major ancient sieges was the siege of Jerusalem in 70 CE, led by the Roman commander Titus, son of Emperor Vespasian. Seven years prior, Jerusalem had been conquered by the Romans and had a compliant local king installed, but the city had since shaken off Roman rule by the way of the first Jewish revolt. By the year 70, the Jewish rebellion had been driven back far enough that most rebels were trapped inside Jerusalem, beginning a siege in which Romans continued to allow Jewish pilgrims to enter, but refused to allow them out. Over the course of months, Rome starved out the Jewish zealots and other militias inside, and by August, they'd broken through to Jerusalem's innermost defenses and destroyed the city's second temple. It was this breakthrough by the Romans and the subsequent massacres and expulsion of the Jewish population that set the stage for all of Judaism to go into a rabbinical period that would last over a millennium. Some 700 years later, the city of Xu Yang would be the target of a siege launched by a rebel army, the Yan, against China's ruling dynasty at the time, the Tang. In this siege, some 150,000 rebels encircled a Tang force of less than 10,000 who were forced to hold out inside the fortified city. But rather than just capitulating to the Yan, the Tang resulted to psychological warfare tactics, playing battle drums during the night and posturing as if they meant to break out in an attack. This forced the Yan defenders to keep night watches and make ready for battle each time the war drum sounded, exhausting them to the point of complacency. But the Yan's eventual assessment that the Tang were merely posturing led the Yan to let their guard down so badly that the Tang did launch raids, killing thousands of Yan and nearly killing their siege commander. Eventually, the Yan turned to starvation tactics, forcing the Tang to turn to cannibalism in order to survive. By the time the Yan took the fortress, less than 400 Tang defenders survived, but the dead had taken with them some 120,000 Yan forces in an absolutely grueling ordeal. Stopping over in the 900s, we've got to pay homage to the absolute badass that was Olga of Kiev, then regent and leader of the Kievan Rus. After a protracted and nasty rivalry with the neighboring group, the Dravelians, that had seen Olga's own son murdered, the Kievan Rus had been able to beat back Dravelian forces in open battle and besiege them in their own city of Iskoristan. After a long siege in which the Kievan Rus were unable to force a surrender, Olga was able to convince the Drevlian defenders to agree to providing a tribute and subsuming themselves to Kievan rule. But rather than ask for gold or supplies, the story goes that Olga asked for three sparrows and three pigeons from each house of the city. Relieved of paying such a small price for their survival, the Drevlians supplied the birds, only to have Olga instruct her army to attach pieces of burning sulfur to the birds and release them, knowing that the birds would return to their roosts. When they did, they engulfed the Drevlian city in flames, burning it to the ground and ending the siege with authority. Moving to the late 1200s, we come across the Siege of Acre in 1291, which turned out to basically be the end of European crusaders' ability to assert influence in Jerusalem. In this battle, about 15,000 crusaders were set upon by a far larger Mamluk army, cutting the crusaders off from the surrounding land. The siege featured heavy bombardments by the Mamluk side and counter raids in unsuccessful attempts to break the siege. When the Mamluk assault finally took place, it was after many parts of the wall surrounding Acre had already been collapsed by undermining, so that the attackers could pour through the breach points in nigh on unstoppable numbers. In the space of a day, the city was captured, looted, and its defenders were massacred in what would be the functional end of the Jerusalem Crusades. Before long, siege warfare was forever changed by the widespread use of the cannon. Similar high-intensity projectiles have been used in sieges past, starting with China's use of rockets many centuries prior, and the cannon first made an appearance in European sources in chronicles of the Siege of Sigilmasa in 1274. But to really explore their effect, 
We need to look at the Battle of Vienna in 1683, when 150,000 Ottoman attackers besieged 11,000 Viennese troops inside their city. The battle was significant for several reasons. Firstly, the choice by the Viennese to level the outskirts of their own city in order to eliminate cover for the Ottoman forces. Then there was the abundance of cannons on both sides, but especially inside the city on the Viennese side. And there's also the Ottoman attempts to tunnel underneath the city and bring down its walls. And lastly, there's the relief that eventually lifted the siege. A massive charge by 70 to 80,000 Polish, Lithuanian, German, and Austrian troops led by 3,000 revered winged hussars. It was this battle that put an end to Ottoman expansion into Europe and the high watermark of that particular empire's reach. And now let's travel to the Spanish city of Ceuta on the North African coast, where several thousand Spanish soldiers endured the longest siege in recorded history. Across a full 26 years, Spanish forces held out against tens of thousands of Moroccan troops outside, enduring innumerable bombardments and raids. For the duration of the siege, Spain was able to sustain its city by sea, and eventually Spain won by simply waiting the Moroccans out. When a succession crisis caused chaos within the Moroccan Sultanate in 1727, the siege on Ceuta was lifted, basically without a fight. In the latter half of the 1700s, one of the first major sieges in the New World took place at the city of Boston from April 1775 to March of 1776 in the opening phase of the American Revolution. After tensions between British soldiers and colonial militias spiraled out of control in the battles of Lexington and Concord, the colonies of New England collectively placed the city of Boston under siege, owing to its role as Britain's trade and military capital in the area. Surrounding the city on three sides, the American colonists were able to blockade the city and get Patriot residents, the ones who supported the revolution, out of the city while allowing British loyalists on the outskirts to flee to British-controlled areas. The siege saw skirmishes and major battles as each side attempted to consolidate the territory it had. But the main active element was the effects of the colonial continental army and its seaborne allies in interrupting British supply and support. Within just over 10 months, the continental army was able to force a British withdrawal to Nova Scotia liberating the city of Boston for the Americans. And now heading across to Eastern Europe and partially the now annexed modern-day Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea, we find the 1854 siege of Sevastopol, an 11-month siege of a critical port city that meant to devastate the Russian Black Sea fleet that was anchored there. A joint British and French force besieged the city by land after pushing nearby Russian troops into a retreat, while their fleet blockaded the entrance to Sevastopol's harbor. In this particular siege, the city withstood months of bombardment while the British and the French repelled multiple Russian attempts at a breakthrough. But the tides turned in the Crimean winter, with the French and British armies on the ground ravaged by disease. When winter gave way to spring, it took French and British forces two attempts to take the city, which was finally razed to the ground and evacuated by the Russians 11 months after the siege began. With Sevastopol went Russia's will to fight, and peace uh, was settled upon shortly afterward. And now moving on, World War I. No better example of siege warfare than the siege of Przemysl, a now Polish city that was caught up in the violence on the Eastern Front between Imperial Germany and Austria-Hungary on one side and Tsarist Russia on the other. A fortress city that was Austria-Hungary's linchpin of its eastern defense, Przemysl was protected by over 30 forts outside the city limits, and in August of 1914, it was a prime target for the Tsarist armies marching westward. Although the town was fortified with over 50 kilometers of freshly dug trenches and over 1,000 kilometers of new barbed wire and defended by well over 130,000 Austro-Hungarians, it was surrounded by a full 300,000 Russians. The city got a brief taste of siege in September, which saw the Russians throw themselves against its walls for little to no gain and the loss of 40,000 men. But after the Russians withdrew and later returned in November, the same city came under siege again. This time, the Russians opted for starvation and heavy bombardment and sat back to watch while cholera and ethnic tensions tore Przemysl apart from the inside. When the Russians decided it was time to strike several months later, the city was overwhelmed quickly, and 117,000 men in its garrison, including nine generals and 2,500 officers, surrendered without a fight. As for World War II, there are two major sieges that we need to discuss, one in each theater of war, Leningrad in the Soviet Union and Manila in the Philippines. In the case of Leningrad, the Soviet city weathered two full years of siege by the German Wehrmacht, enduring incredible cold, widespread disease, and food scarcity so bad that about a million civilian non-combatants would die by the time the siege lifted. For those two years, Leningrad, today known as St. Petersburg, was constantly attacked by air and shelled, and during the winters the city could only supply itself with a single road over the Lake Ladoga. 
By the time the siege lifted, the city had resorted to cannibalism, something for which 2,000 people would be arrested by the Soviet authorities. And then there was the siege of the bustling city of Manila, where over 15,000 Japanese defenders had retreated after being pushed off of the rest of the Philippine Islands by American and other Allied forces. On the one hand, this battle was an intense, grinding affair of urban warfare, but on the other, it was in many ways a willful siege, with Japanese troops barricading themselves into many interlocking layers of defense in order to buy time to fortify Japan's home islands against an unexpected invasion. Over the course of the siege, Japanese forces would commit innumerable atrocities against the city's civilian population as food, ammunition, and water ran low, destroying massive sections of the city in the process. After a final siege, the walled fortress of Intramuros was broken by heavy artillery fire, and the city was taken by the Americans, leaving behind a manila that bore little resemblance to the one that had existed a few months prior. But if anybody around the world had thought that the end of World War II would mean the end of major sieges, they were sorely disappointed a few years later during the Berlin blockade, which saw the Soviet Union block railroad and canal access to parts of Berlin that were demarcated as being under Western Allied control. Although war had not been declared at that time, and wouldn't be declared over the course of the crisis, Berlin always put under siege with millions of people still inside its borders. In a testament to how long a siege can be sustained using modern aircraft, American and British forces flew more than a quarter of a million flights over Berlin over the nearly year-long crisis. These planes dropped over 3,400 tons of supplies every day and logged a total number of flight miles just short of the distance between the Earth and and the sun. Eventually, the Soviet blockade was lifted, in a modern example of the besieged successfully waiting out their besiegers. And lastly, in our list of historical examples, we simply can't pass over the siege of Sarajevo that saw the city surrounded and blockaded by Yugoslavian forces who fell under Serbian control within the first few months of the siege. It was the longest siege of a capital city in modern history, at nearly four years, and featured some 70,000 Bosnian defense forces and thousands more civilians inside the city cut off from gas, electricity, and water, often for periods of six months or more at a time. The siege was remarkable for the abundance of snipers on both sides running a campaign of terror from within the city, and it was further defined by a wide range of other atrocities and indiscriminate killings of civilians. By the time the siege lifted, courtesy of a NATO air campaign, some 40% of the 70,000-ish children who had weathered the siege had been shot at directly by snipers, and half had witnessed somebody be killed personally. And finally, in the modern day, sieges have unfortunately become no less common among the major and minor conflicts of the world. Far from the fortifications and citizens of old, sieges of the 21st century almost always take place in cities, where the product of decades and decades of urban development will afford a far greater degree of cover and insulation than any single military encampment ever could. First, we go to the siege of Aleppo during the height of the Syrian civil war. In this battle, a number of sides warred for control of the city. The Syrian Arab army under Bashar al-Assad, the al-Nusra Front, the Syrian Democratic Forces, the Islamic State, and a range of other militias. Although the overall battle lasted a span of four and a half years, taking some 32,000 or more lives in the process, and saw the use of chemical weapons, barrel bombs, intentional airstrikes against rescue workers, and summary executions of civilians, it's one particular moment that bears discussion today. A moment in 2016 in which both the rebel militias and the Syrian government forces were able to place each other under siege simultaneously. The battle was highly asymmetrical, with a pocket of Syrian army troops holding out in the city center and surrounded by militias, but a pocket of militia-controlled area wrapping around the besieged Syrian army and going deep into enemy territory, thus becoming encircled themselves in a strange situation where both besieged sections were essentially an anvil pinning each other in place against an onslaught from all sides. When the siege eventually broke, it was in the Syrian government's favor, in a cascade that would eventually place all of Aleppo back under their control. And then there's the Battle of Mosul, which took place over nine months in 2016 and 2017 between a defending force of about 10,000 Islamic State militants and an attacking force of over 100,000 Iraqi and Kurdish forces supported by the United States, France, Turkey, and the United Kingdom by air. In a battle that quickly became the world's most grueling urban combat since World War II, the Islamic State was able to hold back the coalition advance for months, relying not on physical fortifications, but booby traps, asymmetrical raids, and individual fighters or small teams who 
each held out for hours or days at a time in last stands, slowing down the advance every time until they could be dealt with. By the time the siege finally broke, thousands of civilians and thousands more Islamic State fighters had been killed, finally pulling back the curtain on a city that had been ravaged by its Islamic State occupiers before it was brought back under Iraqi control. And finally, we go to the port city of Maripol during the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Besieged in the early days of the conflict by 14,000 Russian soldiers and Russia-backed separatists, and defended by somewhere between three and 8,000 Ukrainians, Maripol was a critical strategic asset and caught the attention of some of Russia's most battle-ready regiments. For nearly three months, the city was surrounded and shelled from the outside, with Ukraine first holding out across the city, and then having chunk after chunk bit off by Russian bombardment and troop advances. By the second month of the siege, the remaining Ukrainian defenders were forced to withdraw to the Astaval Steelworks, a massive sprawling compound that was turned into an improvised fortress. Relying on the safety of workshops and tunnels that were difficult to bombard and easy to defend, the Ukrainian defenders there were blockaded and besieged for another month. The thing that eventually turned the tide was Russia's use of thermobaric bombs or vacuum bombs, which eventually compelled Ukraine's president to order the troops inside the plant to surrender. As the 2020s stretch on, it's clear that sieges are as much a weapon of war as ever, now more likely to take place in cities with their high civilian populations and their reliance on easily destroyed supply chains. It's not hard to argue that sieges have actually grown worse, or at least more devastating to the people involved in the modern era. Add to that not only the addition of artillery, but of advanced and highly destructive munitions that an attack inside can lob inward at will, and the sieges of today favor an attacking side more than ever. But there's one fundamental truth of the siege that rings true today just as much as it ever has, that all but guarantees they'll continue to happen despite the level of devastation a defending side will be forced to endure. Now, as ever, a siege will only happen when a defensible position is deemed so important to the defending side that they must protect it, and so important to the attacking side that they must take it. If a modern siege does take place, it's because there is something in that besieged place that is worth defending, be it sovereignty, strategically critical assets, or just as often, the lives of innocent civilians. It's those immensely valuable factors, now as ever, that will continue to place defending armies into a siege that must hold at all costs, even when those sieges for a defending side are more unwinnable than ever.